Hi, Steve here at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together 2 Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we had reached the 11th verse of the 7th chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we stand in Thy presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, Thankful, so very thankful for this privilege and opportunity to feast together upon thy word. As we approach your word, we are very conscious of the energy of our enemy, the deceitfulness of sin, and the frailty of our flesh. I ask that the Holy Spirit direct this time that we be guarded from human logic but that our hearts would be open to the wondrous truth of thy word in order that Christ may be glorified. For it's in his name I pray. Amen. We have been looking at the Holy Spirit's message to the believers at Corinth. And I have asked all of you along uh, as we've studied along here, I've asked you that you carefully remember that the author is the Holy Spirit. We're not looking at the logic of, of some human, but we are looking at a message from our God. We've seen that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. In fact, we were told that that's God's purpose he was in Christ before the foundation of the world, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing men's trespasses unto them, and he's delivered to us that ministry. Not a ministry of something God is doing, but a ministry of something God has done. And much of the so-called evangelistic message today is a message of something that God would do if man would do something. The truth is we've been delivered a responsibility to declare what God has already done. We found that in the declaration of that message that we should not receive God's grace casually uh, in a light fashion, uh, we should not receive His grace in vain, that we should be greatly concerned about our fellowship with the Lord, about our use of His Word, and about our fellowship with other believers. And then we found that, that we should separate ourselves from unbelievers in the ministry, this ministry of reconciliation. Now, where that leads you, uh, and your own personal conviction is between you and the Lord. But the central theme is our responsibility as ministers of the gospel of reconciliation. And in the exercise of that responsibility, we are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. We're told that God has chosen us that we are his children, that he is our God, and that now by means of obedience, not only is he our God and, and we his children, but he will be our father and we his sons and daughters. The words are describing fellowship. And I suggest to you that this passage, as many as, as any in the word of God, if not more, highlights the sovereignty of our God in our lives. And in this message, you know, I'm not sure that we can separate the two, the message from our life, a walk of fellowship, one spirit, one mind, one will, one purpose. The seventh chapter uh, begins, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of flesh and spirit, 
Uh, the word promises there is the same word from which we get the word gospel, euagelion. Having therefore this agreement, this commitment, this contract, this grand news, not some light promise that may or may not be true, but something that is true. That's one of the great faults in the proclamation of the gospel today. We are inclined to proclaim it as though it isn't true yet, but it could be true if you do something. And folks, that is not good news. The grand news that we have to proclaim is that God did this. We are His children. He's our God. We have the opportunity of fellowshipping as sons and daughters, and our relationship to God is not based on human response. It's not based on human performance, but it's based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Having therefore this commitment, this grand news from God. Now we ought to cleanse ourselves from everything that would outwardly defile flesh and spirit. And the language here, folks, is so beautiful. If you read the Greek, it cannot mar the interior, only the exterior, because you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And God did that. You did not. You are not clean inwardly because you turned over a new leaf. You know, because you committed your life to Christ, because you made certain commitments. You are clean, dearly beloved, and pure and spotless because Jesus Christ died in your place. Colossians declares that he presents you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Such amazing grace, and we immediately, immediately we poison it by suggesting that this could be true if you make it true. 1 John, whosoever is born of God does, doth not commit sin, for his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin. And because man is unwilling to agree that Christ in his finished work made you the righteousness of God in Christ, we come around with something like, well, yes, the new nature can sin, but it won't habitually practice sin. And Folks, we dilute a passage of grand declaration from God. We see the same thing in 1 Thessalonians. I have grand news for you. Whether you're faithful or not faithful, you'll live together with Him. Why? Because Jesus Christ died in your place. And time after time after time, the argument comes back, you know, well, yeah, Steve, but all such preaching leads Christians to loose living, you know, and moonshine and all the rest, you know. Well, hold on a second. I started out as a Christian from day one, thinking that I was believing that I was saved by grace. You, you know, that amazing thing, you know, great grace. So now I've been wrong all this time. The Word of God declares that your new man has no ability, has no power to sin. Having that commitment, that grand news, that agreement with God, then let's set out in this area of fellowship, cleansing ourselves from every outward defilement of flesh and spirit. Because inwardly, it cannot be done. You are pure, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in God's sight. And folks, that is good news. And I am told that His sheep will hear His voice. 
we already saw in 1 Corinthians 14, as we studied the first epistle of Corinthians, that if the gospel of Christ is properly proclaimed, it will comfort you, encourage you, and instruct you. If you're convicted in any service in which you attend, that is not the Word of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ, dearly beloved, encourages you, comforts you, and strengthens you. Then beginning at the second verse, we have all kinds of, of comments in the commentaries. You know, now, now, you, now you begin to see the heart of Paul, the deep love of Paul, the passion of Paul, the commitment of Paul, and man will do everything that he can to lead you away from Christ, to Paul. Dearly beloved, the testimony of the Holy Spirit is Paul was chief of all sinners. Chief of all sinners. That's what the Word declares. If you think that you are a worse sinner than Paul, then you've got to argue with the Holy Spirit. I don't believe that that, is, that was some mock humility on the part of Paul that had him declare that he's the chief of sinners. I believe that is the Holy Spirit declaring that Paul was such a man. I do not believe the purpose of 2 Corinthians chapter 7 is for you and I to make a superhero out of Paul, but rather to give us, give us tremendous insight into the heart of our God. We are not looking at the heart of Paul, okay? We are looking at the heart of God. So we saw that God's heart is enlarged toward us. When we were back in the sixth chapter, we had the Holy Spirit, not Paul, say, look, I've opened my heart to you. You know, I think most halfway decent parents would say to their, to their children, no matter what you do, you're my child. I won't disown you. I won't forsake you. I won't ever leave you. You are mine. You're my child. I've already forgiven you of everything you'll ever do against me. And that's what God says to you. Having already forgiven us every trespass. And folks, he wrote that 2,000 years ago before you were ever born. He declared to you openly that he's already forgiven every trespass you could ever possibly commit and that you stand before him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. That you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. His heart is open to you. The Holy Spirit says, open your heart to us. The Holy Spirit cries out that we should open our heart to Him. If we could be as open, I think, before God, if we could extend ourselves toward God in any way, like He extends Himself toward us, there wouldn't be any problem in cleansing ourselves from every defilement of flesh and spirit. But you see, it comes down to motive. Why are we doing that? We've seen in all these epistles that a, a reception of the Word of God brings about a tremendous earnestness, uh, uh, diligence, and care in the life of, of the Christian. One way or another, we are firmly convinced that it is law that will control the believer and the Word of God is absolutely dedicated to the fact that you are not under law but under grace. The grace of God in the Word of God led to great care, earnestness, diligence, 
God's concern for the believers at Corinth was that they walk in grace and not take it in vain. I, don't, I do not believe that sin at Corinth, as carnal as they were, I don't think sin was why the letters were written, nor were they written in defense of those who suffered from the guy who had his father's wife. That is absolutely not why the letters were written. They were written in order that we, you and I, might realize the wonders of His grace for those who are in Christ Jesus. What God is really pointing out to you is that regardless of the condition in your life, His love is unchanging. God says this throughout the Psalms. He's, throughout the Psalms, He says that His love is absolutely unaffected and unchanged by your behavior or your performance. Boy, that's contrary to popular preaching. God does not love you more when you're good and less when you're bad. One of the great outstanding revelations of the Word of God is the constancy of our God's love. Okay, verse 13, Therefore we were comforted. That's a perfect passive. Therefore, we have been made comforted. We have been comforted with the consummate result that we will remain comforted in your comfort. And their comfort was from God. I believe that the overwhelming context of chapter 7 is a spiritual vitality among believers and nothing to do with anything material. None of that is in this chapter. The overriding concern was a problem that dealt with the, the spiritual vitality of the believer and the overriding comfort comes from the, the attitude of the believer toward the Word of God. And the attitude of God toward the believer. That's the result of this great comfort. Yea, and accordingly, the, the more joyed we, we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. There, there is a tremendous spirit of comfort and joy based upon the spiritual relationship of other Christians and to God and to each other. Verse 14, for if I have boasted anything to him of you, that's a first class condition. You can change the if to since. And now once again, the easiest thing for any minister to say, well, you know, is Paul apparently had boasted to the believers at Corinth about Titus. You know, what a tremendous guy he was. And folks, that's probably true. I don't argue that at all. I'm not exactly certain what great lesson that you get out of that. Is this some portion of the Word of God that suddenly becomes very light and casual? You know, we don't really, we really don't have to spend much time studying. Or is the Holy Spirit telling you and me something here? Is it the Holy Spirit who exalts the believer? I think it's, a, it's an easy thing to wonder whether or not God really loves somebody. I mean, I, I know what a, oh, I know what a Christian is. You know, a Christian is one who goes to church three times a week, Sunday morning. The really good ones, well, they go to church Sunday evening. You know, the, the really, really good ones go on Wednesday you know, the ones really interested in the things of the Lord, they go on Wednesday night. You know, those are really dedicated Christians. You know, thank God BHF doesn't have any of those. You know, we all, we all know who those are. And 
folks, those are the kind of guilt feelings that can be put out so that, you know, we get people to do things and, and we begin, you know, so I can get you to mow the grass at the church, or, you know, or whatever. And we, and we begin to grade Christians. Dearly beloved, you are the stage upon which God is performing the exercise of His grace that is not only a humbling thing, but a constraining thing. And it's all because of what Christ did, not you. And as a matter of record, as a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ. He doesn't even glorify Himself. Have you ever stopped to realize that not only is God boasting about you, but He's using you on a stage. You know, to the world, you are a spectacle. You know, that's, that's a, the word is, means a, a, a theatrical performance where principalities and powers can observe the exercise of God's grace operating in you, operating in children of His own. Marvelous, marvelous truth. I have boasted, I'm not ashamed. This is the Holy Spirit talking, not Paul, you know, who's been asleep in the Lord for 2,000 years. But as we, as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. We spoke all things in truth, and our boasting, which we made before Titus, is also true. It's going to be the exercise of God's grace, but it's true. I'm absolutely certain from a human standpoint, you can, you can charge me with sin, but you can't do that before God. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ Jesus who died If you're to go before God and condemn me of sin, God's going to say, but I justified him. Well, you made a mistake, God. I mean, you know, he, he's one who shouldn't have been justified. <laughs> Folks, I don't, want to be, I don't want to be the one who tells God that he made a mistake. You know, you can. I don't want to do that. And if God justified you, I can't stand before God and say, boy, that was a, that was a pretty stupid thing to do. You know. You know, there's, there's one guy who shouldn't have been justified. Because now my argument is suddenly with God, with the Almighty God, and not with you. Dearly beloved, if we lose sight of the fact that we are redeemed, justified, holy, unblameable, unreprovable, in His sight, we have lost entire contact with the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, we, we can pull a verse out of context, you know, and say, well, be holy as he is holy. And now, you know, so now we can start teaching some kind of outside holiness, which isn't, isn't called, it's not called outside holiness. It's called practical holiness because the Bible says you've got to be holy like he's holy. And that is pure falsehood. You will be holy because he is holy, says the word of God. You are not holy, folks, because you did something. Holiness has nothing to do with action, but with the separation of the sovereign God for His own use. God separating you, sanctifying you for His own use, for His own purpose. And that's you. God loves you. Not that He loved you. He loves you. He separated you unto Himself. That's the word holy. And He did that by the sovereign action of His grace. And now before principalities and powers, before created hosts of all eternity, God boasts about you. You know, God only gave four reasons why He ever created anything. You know, of course, one, you know, to make his wrath known against sin. But one of the four reasons that God gives for creating, for, for even beginning this process through which you and I are, are living, 
uh, in time rather than eternity was to show his grace upon vessels of mercy. Boasts about that boasting does two things. It establishes the validity of the believer on, on the one hand, and it's a constant, it is a constraint, constant constraint on the believer on the other end. His inward affection is more abundant towards you while he remembers the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. If there's a, a mutual agreement in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the word of God, there is growth. Verse 16, I rejoice therefore that I have confidence in you all I have confidence in you in all things. And folks, that is only possible because God is sovereign. God's constant concern is His Word and your fellowship with Him. And when God speaks of giving you all things, all things, I think it's very apparent in the Word of God, only the casual reader or, or only a casual reading is really necessary to realize that materially that's not where God's concern is centered, but in the vitality of a spiritual relationship. And when he speaks of all or all things, he's speaking of the Word of God. When he says he's given you all things, I don't believe there's any error nor, nor, nor any boast in that statement. But it's a simple, a simple idiom that is, that's used consistently throughout the Bible that speaks of the Word of God. For you know all things. You know, I, I read that word and I think, but you know, well, there's a lot of things that I don't know. You know, like, like complex equations that, you know, that leave me buffaloed. So, you know, God must have made a mistake. Obviously, that's not what he's saying. If there is something I don't know that God wants me to know, it's because I have not given diligence to his word. For everything, everything, folks, that God wants me to know, he's told me and nothing more. The reason I believe the Holy Spirit can speak with confidence is because of the sovereignty of God, not the obedience of the Christian. If it had to do with the obedience of the Christian, he couldn't have that confidence. And folks, I do not mean to minimize obedience, but the underlying foundation of all of this relationship, the stability of that relationship, is the sovereign power of God manifested in His grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not, not, the human response to that. And now that ends, that ends chapter 7. First of all, in chapter 8, the word grace appears seven times. Uh, verses 1, uh, 4, 6, 9, uh, 7 and 9, I believe. In 16, the word thanks is the word grace. And in verse 19, you read the word grace. That's seven times it appears in the 8th chapter. Now, I'm not going to make any great highlight out of the number 7. Uh, you know, we all know that it means completion or perfection. I'll simply point out to you that seven times the word grace appears in the 8th chapter. I want to point that out before we move into the 8th chapter. Now, reading from the Greek, we make known unto you the grace of the God having been bestowed, and that's a perfect passive, in the churches of Macedonia. Those churches are the, the, the church of Thessalonica, the church at Philippi, and the, the Berean church, the church at Berea. You'll remember the Berean Christians were more noble than those of 
of uh, Thessalonica, for they search the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things be so. Uh, but none of that, folks, is mentioned here. These also are called out brethren for Christ. Not only are they called out ones, but so are the Corinthians. And if we were to take a poll, you know, of all of the churches mentioned in the New Testament, we'd have to vote Corinth number one in rottenness, okay? But they're all brothers. They're all brothers. They're all linked together. Now, the theme of verse one is grace. And not only is it grace, but it's God's grace. So whatever we're going to learn, folks, in the rest of the chapter, whatever we're going to talk about in, in the, in the so-called great collection or the ministry of the saints or whatever it is, we must not lose sight of the fact that it, it is centered squarely in the grace of God bestowed upon these churches. The staggering thing is that the grace of God bestowed upon those churches was a great trial of affliction. That's what boggles the mind. The word trial uh, is an interesting Greek word, which means to submit to intense heat or, or trial so that the dross can be burned off. You know, it's pictures Bama is what it does. Uh, you know, we lose a, a lot of the validity of the word if we don't realize that when we refine gold, we expect to get dross as well as gold. God's grace was not manifested in their abundance of riches and their, and their peace and their joy, although that, of course, is true. But here in this context, it was not just a trial, but a great trial a severe trial of hardship, of persecution, of martyrdom uh, at a time in which the church was, uh, was in its infancy. You know, I, I try to resist go, going back, backtracking, you know, too much, but... Uh, Having therefore, first verse of chapter 7, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If you broke that verse down and dissected it word for word, you'd see the beauty and the wonder of that. It's not law keeping at all. The big question for us is how those who are, of us who are concerned about our fellowship and our walk and, and truth and grace and, and our communion and fellowship with God and, and in Christ, you know, and in our study of the Word, you know, if we really mean business, you know, I think we're going to want to ask ourselves how all of this really truly becomes effective in our life, in our lives. You know, we, we, we Christians, we can sit around and we can talk a lot about, you know, how to, how to, how to accomplish whatever. If you believe that the Bible is a rule book, if you believe that this is a, a rule book on how to live the Christian life, if that's how you look at it, you know, I think then you miss seeing that this is not a rule book on how to live the Christian life. It is primarily a revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ in every verse, on every page, every chapter, every book. We truly are saved by grace. You know, the objection automatically is always, you'll always hear it. You know, well, if that's true, Steve, you know, we can just go live however we want. You know, it's as if you're not already sinning more than you want. And I, and I would hope that, that you are sinning more than you want, you know. 
The argument just doesn't hold water, folks. The change comes through grace. We benefit so much from it. We, we come to know a joy and a peace, you know, a joy that, that uh, peace that passes all understanding, a joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. We come to learn to rest in Him and His person and His work. That we can't, you can't improve upon a new sinless nature, a new nature. You can only try to understand how it is that we come to perform and function out of that new nature. And of course, the way that we do that is according to the truth. Uh, walking in, in grace, not law. I want to take a moment to thank you all for praying for the direction of this ministry and praying for Sue and I. You need to, to know that we you're in our hearts daily. We pray for you constantly. We love you. We truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.